What's up guys, this is Derek Kirby back again, back again, post Texas power outage. If you don't already live in Texas and you've been kind of wondering where the hell I've been, where the hell Dallas Prospect content has been, I'll answer that. Even though you've probably already seen me mention it in the community tab, I can elaborate a little bit here. And I'll get through that quick and then we can talk a little bit of Mavericks news before their game tonight. So with this, Texas had a pair of historic winter storms in the past week, and our power grid, as it turns out, is like 95% separate from the rest of the country, from the rest of the United States. It's the only state, I believe, with that kind of structure, and as a result, the, the vulnerabilities of its design were pretty much a perfect a perfect uh, amalgamation for this type of disaster to occur. Now, what happened with that is we had sub-zero temperatures through these storms. The energy usage went through the roof. We weren't able to offset that. And so we came through the president of ERCOT, who is the leader of this, the guy who runs this uh, this management company overseeing the Texas power grid. His quote was that we were seconds and minutes from a total collapse of the Texas power grid, which would have resulted in millions of people going four months without power as they had to meticulously rebuild it. Now, that that's great that they were able to salvage that at the last moment. But the inherent flaws in the system itself, not to mention how disastrously they handled the rolling outages, really, really demand an investigation. Something has to be. I'm not saying like, hey, prosecute this guy. No, I'm just saying look into it, figure out what the hell went wrong. And there's already some knowledge of what happened. They they completely punted on the idea of winterizing the wind turbines. So the way they try to spin it is saying like, oh, wind energy failed, and that's what led to the state power grid collapse. Are you kidding me? Wind energy is 10% of the power grid. They don't talk about how coal and oil and those plants froze over and it drastically tanked the amount of energy that was available in the first place. And I'm not getting into all of that right now. I'm just saying... It's not it's never just a one simple thing. They didn't winterize the turbines. And so even though those were briefly actually, I think, overproducing for what was projected, those froze up as well. And just, you know, kind of like everything else, we wound up in a major pinch. Now, I was actually fortunate at my house. Our one really bad night was Sunday night. The outages were supposed to begin Monday, the rolling outages. And I'll get into those in a moment and where the flaw was even and how those were handled. But we actually have several transformers around us and several of them just blew overnight. And so from about 845 Sunday night until 530 Monday morning, we were off and on with power as they were, you know, crews were out there working in just single digit temperature, not to mention wind chill, like absolutely courageous what those guys were doing those men and women were doing i don't i don't i assume there were women out there as well i'm not trying to put it in those terms but incredible what they were doing we still had stretches of two hours at one point and three hours at another if we got power it was for anywhere from three to ten minutes and it was gone again so our house plunged into the low 50s temperature wise my daughter harper had to be moved from her nursery at the front of the house to our bed. We had to place her in the bed between us to keep her warm because it was not safe for her to, you know, stay in her in her nursery in her crib. Now she had a, a baby blanket on her and everything and her sleeper that she wears to sleep is lined and helps guard against that, but it, it's nowhere near enough by itself and you know her face is still exposed and everything and it's just it's not safe. So we had to bring her into our bed and huddle around her to keep her warm until morning. Like, that was hard. That was difficult because you feel helpless in that situation. The roads are completely iced over. You're saying to yourself, if I tried to go somewhere, where would I go? 
when I go to a hotel, those are already packing up fast. And at that point, they probably would have had open openings for us. But as the days rolled on and these outages got worse, the rolling outages weren't uh, distributed like they were supposed to be. It was supposed to be like 10 to 45 minute windows without power. And instead, you had some coincidentally uh, or not coincidentally wealthy neighborhoods that weren't touched at all by outages or hardly at all and others that were multiple, multiple outages spanning hours, if not days at a time. Now they did walk that back a little bit. ERCOT did and say like, look, you know, that was our initial projection for how long these would last. It's now significantly longer because this is not going well. We had other issues that came about where the water treatment facilities were having their own outages, which led to a you know frozen pipes as well like water pressure dropped in like over 200 counties in texas and so we had to go to a boil water notice because under 20 psi i think it is you have a, a capacity for harmful bacteria and organisms to get into your water lines and so you can't you have to boil water for everything and i know total first world problem but it is very quickly humbling to have to boil water to give the dogs water for their bowls to drink Normally, yeah, you could drink water bottles. We don't typically do that. We usually use just the purifier built into the fridge. And so to suddenly have to not, you know, not having water bottles on hand and having to boil everything, major humbling experience, having to hand wash every single dish. Uh, again, the dog's water, the water we drank, the water we brushed our teeth with, like it took forever to get anything done. But we were fortunate because while Sunday night was brutal, by Monday morning we did have consistent power restored. It wasn't the only outage we had because thankfully our proximity to a nearby hospital, I think put us on a patch of grid that was supported almost continuously. So that helped us. That said, I didn't want to jump back on here while the state was still in an energy crisis and do a live stream that felt irresponsible to me. And, you know, things were crazy here as is with my wife and daughter. And so I was trying to kind of manage everything and do what I needed to do, help my family and branch out from there. And so now everything is right again. Uh, water notice, boil water notice is lifted. The crisis of energy is over, although there are still millions of people, I think, who don't have power. I mean, we, we at one point had like in the country, these winter storms that affected like 5.1 million people. And before the second winter storm even hit, Texas had 4.3 of those 5.1 million people without power. That's how badly the system failed. And because it's separate from the rest of the national grid, for the most part, there was very little that could be done. Like in Oklahoma, they had issues too, but it's connected to the U.S. power grid. And so it was easy to feed excess energy that direction. It's not just Texas that dealt with it, but Texas's system clearly is vulnerable to certain disasters like this. And then to make it worse, organizations that oversee it, like ERCOT, did not take the steps they needed to. In, in their last meeting, February 9th, before these winter storms, they spent 45 seconds talking about their preparations for the winter storms. And by their own admission, they severely underestimated how devastating these would be to the strain on the grid and everything else. That's why I said, I'm not saying prosecute or persecute. I'm just saying they need to investigate this, find out exactly where they failed and make sure this never happens again. Cause you have people in their own homes who were, you know, exposed to frostbite and shit. Like you had people who were, you know, if you, if you, if you have a fireplace, you were bundled up by that, but you had people who had to set up tents in their living room just to try and like stay warm. You had, People flocking to hotels and hotels were charging something $900 a night, like obscene. That's not okay. And, you know, there was some mayor in Texas who basically had the stance of like, provide for yourself. Do everything yourself. The government owes you nothing. Bitch, then what am I paying you power for? What am I paying for power and energy for if you're not accountable to me? in a crisis that you fail to manage. Like, that's, that's beyond stupid. I get taking social responsibility. I also totally see how 
people are trying to bend over backwards to get out of having to deal with shit. I get it. He's a mayor. He's getting inundated with, you know, people saying, I'm in trouble. I need help. I'm in trouble. I need help, especially during that crisis. But to take that stance and then, you know, he ends up resigning over it to, to go that route is just like, dude, why are you in government if your stance is that the government should do nothing? Like it, there's there's a disconnect, but I digress. Point is, I'm back. The show is back. The Mavericks are back tonight. And we are going to see what this team is moving forward. How good is this team? Are they a team that can not only make the playoffs, but actually do a little bit of something, something? It's crazy that this far into the year, we don't really know how good or bad this team is. And I get it. It's been an up and down year. It's been crazy with health issues and the health and safety protocols in particular devastated this team, hurt them worse, taxed them harder than just about any other team in the league, arguably any other team in the league, period. And as a result of that, we don't know how good they are. But here's here's my two cents. However good Donnie and Mark think this team is. At their best we've seen this year, they can be a team where it's like, hey, they're good enough that if they just got hot at the right time and stayed relatively healthy, they could make a run. That's not good enough. Like, that, you can't just hope that it's that year and we're that damn team. You have to aim higher than that. You have to basically say, Hey, this team has major things we need to address, so uh, let's address them. It's not enough to just sit back on our heels and say, well, I mean, we got Luka having a career year. He was already a top five MVP finalist last year. He's, you know, the, the only reason he's not in that conversation this year is because of how the team has performed. Luka's having a career year pretty much across the board, and he's even shown improvement on defense. And you have people who are trying to dock him and put the entire load and responsibility of everything on on him that's why people are losing their minds uh you know outside of dallas saying like why is luca starting over damian lillard well first of all luca and damian had the same amount of votes uh had the same amount of votes and the fan vote was the tiebreaker so your your quarrel is with the system not with luca versus dame again both are mvp caliber players but for one i don't feel sorry for dame anyway because luca yeah, he started last year, but he didn't get to finish the game last year. He was the only starter that didn't finish the game, and I think at the time he was just very kind of, aw shucks, I'm just happy to be here. I don't think that'll be the case with him this year. I think he would take that as a sign of disrespect. But Dirk in all the years that he was here and how historically great he was had one year where he was an all-star starter. And you know what? He wasn't voted the starter. He subbed in to be a fill-in starter because the guy ahead of him couldn't play in the game that that i mean that alone should say like why i don't give a crap about damian lillard not being the starter who cares and furthermore who cares in general who cares who starts the all-star game everyone's going to get their actual opportunity to do something everyone's going to get minutes to play and perform so why are you getting hung up on that like it's a weird thing where people say on one breath hey damian lillard uh, he deserved that over Luca, and there was some analyst I don't remember who it was, but she was saying as well that um, you know, and this is an East Coast team or an Eastern Conference team, but basically saying like, oh, you know, like well, Bradley Beal, he's obviously deserving an All Star start. Now that's not someone that Luca's standing in the way of, but it's another guy with a completely different argument there. So on one hand, she says Damian Lillard deserves to be the starter over Luca because. His team has done better, and Luca has to bear the weight and responsibility of not doing of the Mavericks not doing better as a team. But then she flips to say for Beal and the Wizards, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Wizards suck. Pfft, not Beal's fault. No one's questioning whether or not Lillard, Beal, or Luca should be all stars. But the argument being used, the logic being applied. She's like, I'm going to use it here because it fits my narrative. But then I'm going to go with this argument over here so it'll fit my narrative now. Never mind the fact that it contradicts that other argument I made one sentence ago. 
I'm going to say that this makes sense because it supports my view of how this should be. I don't care. I don't care. It's why I say I don't pay really any attention to ESPN or Fox Sports 1. These people, like, it's fine. You know, hey, more power to you. If you can make a career in sports journalism, obviously I'm trying to go about that my own way. More power to you if you make that work. But I'm not going to treat you as a serious analyst or journalist if you're going to jump through these hoops, do these mental gymnastics, and try to go with just what sounds like a a debate spurring thing if it's not what you actually think and believe and what the evidence actually points to. Like, at some point, you have to actually take acknowledgement of reality. And this boiled down to, hey, the fan vote determined it. Go figure, the international player got the edge as he's wildly popular. And if you were to put tiers of players in the NBA, I would say Dame and Luca are pretty much same tier. Now, to some fans here, they might be like, ah, hypocrisy, blasphemy. Whatever, dude. Everyone's got their own opinion. You have a right to your opinion. You have a right to be wrong about your opinion. I have the same right. We disagree. I don't care. Regardless, Luca's the all-star starter. Cool. I hope he gets to finish the game this time. Or at least get more opportunity to do something. So that's that's kind of my two cents on that. As for the trade deadline, as we get a chance to see what the team can and maybe could be, I sincerely hope that they make major consideration of moves because Carlisle went on the, the radio, I think it was before the storm or maybe it was after the, the storm had already started, and he basically said the Mavericks aren't looking at a addressing rebounding with a big man type move. And to me, that's a smokescreen. This team, we know how badly they need that. And we know from previous years, Mark Cuban has basically threatened to fire anyone in the organization who leaks to Woj or to Shams. Like, they, he doesn't roll that way. He, does, he tries to play everything close to the vest. He would not be happy about Carlisle going out there and just outright saying, no, we're not looking at that. I also think it's a smokescreen in the sense that they're not they're not going to go to a negotiating table, so to speak, to try and acquire someone, whoever that may be, and say, you have no idea how badly we need this guy on our team, huh? No, you're going to play it close to the vest. You'd be like, yeah, I mean, I'm interested. But you say that because you don't want to pay sticker price. You want to pay 70 cents on the dollar or something, whatever you can to save value. You want to get the guy you want without having to give up the most assets. Now, some of those assets that we need to talk about. Moves the Mavericks have made. We know they made the move to trade up for Luka. We know how huge that was and why that was like, a, hey, uh, this might be like a borderline smartest guy in the room thing that you could say like, oh, hey, they were ahead of the curve, obviously, as it relates to the top three teams in the draft that year. You can look at that, and that's a very good, fair argument. You can also say that even though it's been a more mixed return, the move to go get KP when no one else around the league even knew that he was available or being shopped because the Knicks hadn't said as much, that requires forethought and you pounced on a great opportunity. And you got a better, I, I think, the only way that you could say the Knicks somehow, unless someone the Knicks get with a middle to lower first round draft pick, ends up being a monster there's there's no way you can say that the knicks won the trade and i've had that debate with people before who say oh well the knicks by not keeping kp and paying him the extension they were able to get julius randall who's been great for them and this guy's got promise yeah that's great but that's a move that came after that doesn't make sense to it it's separate act it's separate transactions the trade is who did we give you you wasted everything we gave you. We either let, you either traded them, let them go, or ruined them like Dennis Smith Jr. And, you know, now he's in Detroit, and I think he got the start the other night. So, you know, best of best of luck to you in, uh, in Detroit, Dennis. But other than that, it's just the draft picks you have to look at. We don't know what those are yet. So 
There's no argument to be had. The fact that you happen to go out and get Julius Randle because you had money available now, well, that's a separate transaction. And I, I still don't think that Randle offsets KP plus every value. Every The only guy in that trade that didn't do really anything for the Mavericks was Courtney Lee. They've made Tim Hardaway Jr. Think what you want about him, whether or not you think he could be the third guy here or that they need to move on from him. They've gotten everything out of him value-wise and more than New York got. They've now brought back Trey Burke and turned him into a, granted his use has dropped down a little bit in the last couple weeks, but they've gotten a lot out of him as well. And you'd be happy about that. Obviously, we know what they've done with KP, and we've seen when KP has been healthy and on, dude is still the unicorn. The question there is his health, how long is he able to stay healthy, and how is he going to play when he's there? Because this year, defensively in particular, he has dropped off a cliff, and that is very concerning for me. But we still see, still, still see flashes. We will see. But the Mavericks made those moves, but they've, they've otherwise played it very close to the vest. They didn't go get help at the deadline last year. The, the summer before that, they didn't really make a big move. That after they acquired KP, they, they had interest in several guys. But if you're telling me we had to hang up our hats on whether or not they got Danny Green... I get it. They thought they were going to get Kimball Walker, which, by the way, smartest guys in the room. Dude hasn't been exactly good in Boston. I'm sure he's now primed for a game of the year performance for him. You know, his best game of the year now once they play Dallas this week. But I digress. They didn't do anything last summer, and they didn't do anything the summer before, you know, before we saw KP play again and now after. The move to trade Curry for Richardson – yeah, Curry's done great, but I think in terms of the return on investment, I think it was the right move. I still stand by that, and I think it's a nice move. I especially like what Tyler Bay has been able to show in the G League in the last week. Really like his future in Dallas, if it is in Dallas. I really like what Tyrell Terry has shown. But this team is not good enough as constructed, even when they were at their peak. Were they capable of making a real run? Yes, but it would take absolute perfect scenario over an extended period of time. I think more, more reasonably, they need to make a move, and I think that's been the case. I expected them to make a move at the deadline. I just hope that they're not looking at what Tyrell Terry and Tyler Bay are doing, and both of which have me very excited about the future if they're in Dallas. But I'm hoping they don't look at that and say, Luka's only in year three. He's already been a top five MVP finalist once, presumably now maybe twice by the time this year's up. Uh, KP, you know, if we can just get a little bit of consistency with him in terms of that, if we can match that up, and then you got guys like Bay and Tyrell Terry coming up, you look at the moves they made to address the things they needed to address, they've done it. It's just it hasn't had the time to really blossom. And so it's like, okay, if, you're, if your takeaway is that they need to bring in, that they need to bring in a, a major trade, fine. That's good. I think you should look for that. And I hope that you're not saying to yourself, Mark and Donnie, that, oh, well, we don't really need to do anything because we already have the pieces. We just need to give them time. You need to do something with Luca to try and win and go as far as you can while he's, you know, as cheap as he is. Because you need to lock him down long term at the first opportunity. And then more so, you need to keep in mind the fact that he might not stick around, you know, just because you sign him long term, that doesn't mean it's locked up forever. Now, granted, this was a franchise directed decision. But keep in mind, Blake Griffin signed a Clipper for Life deal and then six months later was dealt to Detroit. And then people talking about the hypothetical of what Detroit's going to do, whether they buy him out or whether he's traded or whatever. Oh, a possible reunion with the Clippers. Oh, and you got analysts like Stephen A. Smith going on there and saying like, oh, well, that, that's an option. But step one's going to be Blake calling and apologizing to Steve Ballmer. Are you kidding me? They stabbed him in the back and they act like he has to come groveling to them. You miss me with that nonsense, man. But that's that's a whole separate thing. Point being, 
these moves don't lock you in where you're like, all right, that's it. That's locked up. Now you got Luca. Like, even once you get Luca on a long term deal, you have to act. More now than ever, players have the power to force their way in and out of situations, whether you look at James Harden, whether you look at Anthony Davis, whether you look at Le. I was going to say LeBron, but I guess he did let his contract in Cleveland finish as well. Point being, the players have the power in this regard. The star players have that power. And while I don't think it's in Luka's nature, like you look at how Luka's handled everything, whether it was the all-star starter controversy with Damian Lillard, him basically saying like, you know, he probably should have started over me. I don't think I've been good enough this year. I think that shows at 22 years old a a stunning amount of humility and leadership. But, you know, it's while he has that very Dirk esque quality to him, I don't, it's not a guarantee like that you're going to have him 20 years like you had Dirk. You're not going to necessarily have him for his career. He wants to win, and it's a different era. Now, you could say, like, hey, if Dirk came up right now, babyface Dirk coming through, would he stay for 21 years in Dallas? Probably not, because it wouldn't be the same Dirk. <laughs> like, it's a different era he grew up in, and so the things that shape and mold him in his perspective are different. So, something you got to take into consideration, I would say. But, uh, yeah, I don't know what it would take for, for Luca to go that route. I just know that you can't look at it and say, like, oh, pfft. We just got to get one here in the next few years and we're all right. Like, no, no, no. You need to go for it now. You need to be willing to be bold and not sit back on your hands and knees and say, like, ah, just keep watering the plant and give it time. Like, no, go do something. Now, I'm not saying sell the farm to to make this big, bold move. You, you did that one time in Dirk's career post-championship, You and you didn't sell the farm, but you made a big push, a seven-player trade, I believe it was, uh, in the Rondo deal. And that blew up in your face because you thought you were the smartest guys in the room and you didn't consider basic things like floor spacing with him and Monte Ellis on the floor. The fact that both of them need the ball in their hands to be effective and the fact that he's a prima donna with major ego issues. And Carlisle has a history of butting heads with point guards anyway. So, yeah, if Carlisle butted heads with Jason Kidd to the point where that nearly blew up a year before the championship, maybe just Maybe consider that that would have been a bad marriage mid-season when you already had a historically good offense. Just throwing that out there. But, man, it is what it is. Like, I want them to be bold, but I don't want them to just swing for the sake of swinging. I want them to actually, like, be thorough and meticulous in the moves, and I don't want them to overvalue what they have. They have a tendency to do that, right? Roddy B, Roddy Bobois. We know how high, like he dropped a 40 piece on Golden State and they were like, untradeable, we will never deal this man. And he did nothing the rest of his NBA career. He was just around. He was just a body on the bench the rest of his NBA career. And, you know, say what you want, but it's like, If that's a Carlisle-driven move, why didn't you trade him if Carlisle wasn't sold on him? We heard from Carlisle that by the All-Star game of Dennis Smith Jr.'s sophomore year, he knew he was done with the prospect of him. How did you not figure that out with Roddy B? How? Tell me how. (laughs) That's, That's the reality of what you're looking at, though. Like, don't over... Like, I'm excited to see what... Tyrell Terry and Tyler Bay and even Josh Green, like what these guys can do in the in the league if we'll just give them the opportunity and a little bit of time to develop. I am excited, but I also understand this team needs major, major, like they need a major move. I'm not saying you got to go trade out four or five players on your roster or anything crazy like that. But you can't tell me, like, if you're in a situation, and I'm going to throw out the most absurd ex- example off the top of my head. If you're in a negotiation to get Bradley Beal, I don't want you saying, like, mm, I don't know about this. I really like Tyler Bay. I don't want him in that deal. I don't like that at all. I will lose my shit <laughs> if we pass on a major deal because we didn't want to give up a rookie 
that we took in the second round. Again, I am excited to see what Bay and Tyrell Terry and them can do. But I also understand that we need to maximize our opportunity now. Luke is on a rookie deal. You need him happy and appeased, and you need to give him major weapons. Tyler Bay might be great, but it's probably going to take a while for him to be great, and he'll be a great role player when that time comes. Same with Tyler uh, Tyrell Terry. He'll be a great role player. That's that's more typical of a of a ceiling that you're looking at. You're not looking at these guys as like, oh, this is the best player or one of the best players Luke has ever played with. No. So don't over don't overvalue your stock and sit back and just say, all right, let's just see what plays out. Understand that you're not always the smartest guy in the room. And more often than not, you've not been the smartest guy in the room for a while. Just, I don't know. We'll see what they do. I'm excited to see what this team actually is one way or the other. I just want to know. And I'm excited about what the future could hold. I'm also interested to see if they've really learned anything as far as a front office is concerned. But that's a story for another time. So that does it for my time, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like this video, drop a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace. From prospect to legend.